Chris, was was this a bombshell? Was this news a bombshell? It was, but because it landed the day that poor old Steve Borthwick is announcing his first uh, England squad, having taken over from Eddie, it was going to be his big day. And sure enough, overnight comes the news that he hasn't gone away. He was just taking a short haul flight to Melbourne or Sydney or anywhere in Australia where they'll give him a contract. And it has just been a gobsmacking incident. There's Paul, Paul, you've got to feel for Steve Borthwick. He's got the job he always wanted. And the first thing he has to do, as he said to us today, is I, had to say, I sent a well done, good luck in your new job message to, uh, to Eddie because that's what he sent to me. So, I mean, did it did it really come out of nowhere? Did you get any inkling? Were there any whispers at all? Well, he made it very clear that he had two offers on the table, and that they were whichever one he took was probably going to be his last big job, because uh, even he runs out of reasons to keep keep doing what he's doing, and it was going to be with a major nation, and we assumed that was Australia after the World Cup, or a second tier nation. At the World Cup, which was there was there was talk of Georgia or Portugal, uh, because you know we we know that he had been tapped up by the Americans to basically take them through to their their World Cup in a couple of World Cups time. But that was a big commitment for for Eddie, and they they have only just come out of bankruptcy. So again, I doubt whether they could probably afford him. The fact that they got rid of Rennie so quickly, I think caught everybody on the hoof, both over here and even in Australia, because uh, you know our colleagues. Uh, in Australia were, were, were pretty amazed that it was so ruthless. But then we are talking about Eddie. OK, so there's no restraint to trade on this, despite the fact that he obviously has a lot of intellectual property as far as English rugby goes. Is that, I mean, is, is that a surprise? It's not a surprise when you know that the, the, the Rugby Football Union have, have been leaking senior uh, members of staff, including their, their sort of the CEO, and uh, Ian Ritchie, who walked across the road and joined Premiership Rugby, the body that spends all its time banging on about the RFP not supporting them, and can we have some more money? So they didn't even do a gardening leave uh, deal when their CEO <laughs> left them and went to the opposition. It happened again when their chief marketing guy left only last year, again to join Premiership Rugby. You know, you can't make these things up. Who allows top executives, or in this case, their national coach to go without some kind of gardening leave uh, option in there, which means he can't work for the opposition or, in fact, can't work in the same job for a set period of time. Now, it's been put to me by, by, by people over here who know these sort of contracts that the only way he may have been able to do this is if he took less money in his payout. Now, if Eddie did that, he would have had to have something very big uh, set up already to compensate for, for dropping down that sort of uh, amount of money. Because let's remember, he was on £750,000 a year and he was meant to go past the World Cup. So we're talking you know, over a million pounds. And for Eddie to take any pay cut at any time of his career, there had to be really good reasons because we know he loves a buck. Chris Jones is with us out of the UK. And the news yesterday, Dave Rennie dumped as the Wallaby coach. We're hearing whispers that there is going to be a New Zealand assistant. Now, these are just whispers. These are just rumours. We don't know whether this is true or not. Straight away, you know, your mind says, oh, Razor, Scott Robertson. Look, I was, I was texting him overnight. He said, Martin, he said, I'm crazy, but I'm not mad, which I thought was a great, a great quote from him. Um, do, you, do you have any intel on that at all? Not at all, but what I do say to anybody considering a job offer from Eddie Jones is let's remember these facts, chaps. In the seven years he was with England, he had 17 different assistant coaches. So if you are going to take the job, just don't unpack the suitcase because you probably won't be there that long. So I think it's got to be the worst job to take in rugby, assistant to Eddie Jones, quite honestly. If he offers me a you, mate, I'd say don't take it. Uh, does he still have it? I mean, you know, we've been around Eddie Jones, both of us, a very long time. I remember, of course, way back in 2003. I mean, I've, I've always liked him, you know, this side of the, the microphone, the media. We like him because he's Eddie Jones, mate, and he gives you a lot of quotes, mate, and he has a go, mate, and all of that kind of stuff. But just in terms of his actual coaching cred, where does he stand at the moment? Does he still have what it takes to, to, to coach any team to win a World Cup? Well, patently, he hasn't coached a team to win a World Cup. He's been a consultant when South Africa won it in 2007. And boy, does he remind you of that. 
No, he's, it's the one thing that's really irritating him, that he hasn't taken a team to a World Cup final and won it. I mean, yeah, he, he, the way they fell apart in Japan, England, uh, under his control, when he got so very wrong in that final, will be really driving him on to have one more go at it. What he's got, though, is, as, we, as you know from the Rugby Championship, he's got a very young Australian team, uh, which doesn't know its first 15. He's going to have to sort that out. They also have, and you know, this is not a great thing to bring Eddie in on, they have a terrible record of injuries. Now, you talk to the England players, and the number of players who got injured in, in England training sessions under Eddie was ridiculous. Some of them even sort of finishing their careers with the injuries they picked up. So he's going to have to change his attitude to the way he works his players. And that's going to be very difficult for Eddie because, you know, what he asks his players is to be harder working and more committed than they've ever been in their lives. And for some of them, it's going to be too hard. Some of them will drop by the wayside in the, in the coming months because they just won't be able to handle what is the whirlwind that is Eddie at the start of a job. Remember, he came into the England job. England were a shambles after that World Cup in 2015. He galvanised them, gave them a very sort of limited way of playing, but got them to believe in themselves, got them organised, and they went to Australia and they won a, a series out there. And, you know, in the last 11 matches between England and Australia under Eddie, England won 10. So he knows how to beat the Wallabies. His problem now, he's got, to, he's got to learn how the Wallabies start winning. The other thing that, you know, I mean, we, and we all, we all you know, mock about this because it is amusing and we all find it amusing that he's been given a deal all the way through to 2027, Chris. And, you know, Eddie Jones, uh, look, uh, you know, I call it the Jurgen Klopp. I mean, what does Jurgen have? About seven years before the itch starts, apparently. And this is the seventh year in Liverpool. You know, same thing happened in Borussia. I mean, who knows whether or not this is there's a coincidence to this. But with Eddie, what we do know is that about every three years, it starts with a hiss and a roar. Everyone loves him. By the time the third year rolls around, people are getting tired. By the time the fourth year, they absolutely hate him and he goes can you see him you know staying in this job right through to 2027 well of course that's when the 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 is hosted isn't it so th there's that major uh carrot uh hanging out there but you're absolutely right muddy two to three years and things start to go a little bit uh smelly you know fish and friends if they hang around too long you know you've got to chuck them out and uh it's been a problem with with, with eddie because the message is that the players have heard are heard so many times at each session. And that's one of the reasons why he keeps on bringing in these assistants to try, to try and change up the voices. But I can tell you what, the England players, after 17 different voices of assistant coaches, didn't know whether they were Arthur or Martha. And now both is going to come in, strip it all back, and actually allow the players to play in the positions they normally play in for their clubs, not, not the ones that have been invented by Eddie, who then clouds the whole issues by telling players they're coming to the squad as an apprentice what does that mean or he goes and purposely doesn't pick players because the, the media are telling him they're the players in form it's those periods of eddie's tenure that really leave you totally confused you know is he is he a fantastic coach or is he just some guy who's got a fantastic amount of one-liners and gets everybody believing him for the first couple of years. And then you start hearing those one-liners again, thinking, well, he said that before. It's not having the effect. And that is the problem with Eddie. Has he got enough time to get, one, the Wallabies ready for this World Cup? And has he got enough in his coaching back pocket to get him to the next one? And it's going to be absolutely fascinating and extremely loud finding out. <laughs> this is the best bit about it. This is why we're all happy about it. I don't know whether I've actually been so enthused about, you know, the announcement of any other international coach in rugby ever. Like when he got the England job, it was a riot, wasn't it? We all loved it. And now he's got the Australian job. And what you're saying, Chris, is very perceptive and that maybe what he's did is to do the rev because Australian rugby at the moment is in a dire position, isn't it? What, five wins out of 14? I know that there were several very close losses and all of that, but, you know, they do have these two rugby World Cups. They're scrapping with us over Super Rugby. That deal's apparently now been done. But, you know, they do have these two rugby World Cups coming and this is, you know, this next four years is crucial for the sport in Australia. They've really got to re-establish themselves and the first, you know, way to do that is your shop window, is your national team, is your Wallabies. 
what I'm what what I'm fearing or, or or what I'm what I'm suspecting is that I think that he is more than capable of getting the Wallabies up to cause an upset at this World Cup. They won't win the World Cup. There's no 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 chance that they will. But they're very capable of beating any team on their day. Would you agree? And he's the kind of guy that could actually get them prepared for that. Yeah, and the problem for England is that any team in the quarterfinals could well be England. And that is going to be an absolutely... Yeah, forget about starting off with the All All Blacks versus France as the opening game. The game everybody will want to see after that will be England versus Australia. Old England against New England. It's going to be absolutely fascinating again. It would just be brilliant. And he will love it. Can you imagine the stuff he's going to be firing out in that week? The only problem he's got is that Steve Borthwick will just ignore it. And I really mean he will just ignore it. And he will let Eddie fire off. Because, look, this is a guy who stood alongside Eddie with Japan. You know, you know when, they, when they beat South Africa, he was alongside him. Got to the World Cup final with England. Who was alongside him? Steve Borthwick. He knows exactly how Eddie works. And that's going to be the biggest thing in England's favour when and if they come up against Eddie in the World Cup, which will be great for everybody outside the England squad. But in it, they will be just listening to Borthwick. And he can bore for England. I tell you what, he can really bore for England because he is so one-eyed about getting things right for his country, getting his team playing you know, with those great English forwards hammering into you and winning line-out after line-out. Yeah, he will bore Eddie to death in the build-up to that quarterfinal. But we will love the other side, won't we? We'll love to listen to the grenades being chucked by Eddie because that's what he does best. I just wonder whether in Australia they are prepared to give him as much rope as he's going to need to change that team, to change the whole system within uh, Rugby Australia to allow him, one, the money, and two, the time, to actually make a difference. And, you know, you, you've seen it across the pond there. They make some terrible decisions at Rugby Australia. This might be a great one, but there's a lot of people saying it could be a disastrous one. Finally, and I'm asking everyone this at the start of the year, and I'm going to revisit this, of course, so you're going to tell me right now, who is going to win the Rugby World Cup? And the sub part of that question is, is it the All Blacks? Because yesterday I started the show by saying the All Blacks are not going to win the Rugby World Cup. But having said that, they've got as good a chance as any team. And I know that sounds completely ridiculous and it's a complete contradiction in terms, but I actually think it's quite right. I don't believe we've got the team to win the World Cup, but I believe that we can beat any team on our day there. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win it. So the floor is yours. Well, as I, I will stick to the, uh, to the uh, pronouncement I made some months ago, uh, that, of course, France will win the World Cup and they will beat New Zealand in the final because the whole reason for the draw being made so early and the way it's been set up is that you guys have to play France in the first game to ensure you play France in the last game. And by then, the French will have got their act together in terms of dealing with the pressure and uh, the demands of being the hosts. And they will beat you in what will be one of the great finals we have seen at the World Cup. Devlin. The platform. Lord Peter Fitzsimons, Happy New Year. And what better news, there couldn't be any better news than your mate Eddie Jones, mate's coming back. <laughs> he is irrepressible. The man they can't keep down. They've sacked him. They've pushed him out of tall buildings. They've slurred his name. They've said, we never want you to darken our towels again. And here he is. He's, un- he's unbelievable. Uh, just Lazarus. I mean, that, that that resurrection gets relegated down to fourth or fifth place now, doesn't it, after this? <laughs> Look, it's bitter for Dave Rennie. I feel for Dave Rennie because he's a lovely bloke. He's highly regarded in the rugby community. But the bottom line is, in the end, it's all very well that, you know, have lost this game by one point, that game by one point, this game by a once-in-a-century Foley who didn't kick the ball out when we had the All Blacks beaten, but at the end of the day, the stats were pretty sobering. 38% win-loss record for the Wallabies ultimately is not good enough, and then should we stay with Dave Rennie on 38% win-loss victory, or Eddie Jones is available, and let's have a look, oh, Eddie Jones, well, he's got a 75% win-loss victory, and he's Australian, um, and he's as mad as a cut snake, but he's, but he's as He's also brilliant in terms of getting results. And what does Australian rugby need right now? We need results. 
Yeah, see, Peter, I mean, that, I'm thinking the same thing. I'm thinking that, you know, I don't know whether this is really long term and he does go through to 2027. But I mean, forget about all of that. It's Rugby World Cup year. You need something right now, don't you? Absolutely. But I mean, look, I, I hate, I feel a bit uncomfortable the fact that you're agreeing with me. Can I, <laughs> can I reconsider my position for a moment? Yes. But look, look, 20, has he been, look, he's signed for, how long has he been signed for? Is it four years? Five friggin' years, mate. Oh, see, that, I didn't, I've only just got my head around that. I'm meant to be the expert. That, that's, Problem, that's Eddie going, look, you know, I'll be there for three years. I mean, the chances of Eddie getting through to five years without sending everybody absolutely spare, I would say very minimal. That is not his track record. His track record is brilliant results in the first three or four years, and then it all starts to fall apart because, you know, the stories about Eddie, about the level of intensity, my favourite stories are, are 6 a.m. meetings for assistant coaches at 6 a.m. on the Sunday morning after the Saturday night test no. match. Can you imagine? And you've got assistant coaches who say, listen, you know, I just, whatever you're paying me, whatever the results, I don't want to live like that. I can't live like that. And yet that is the kind of, that's his vibe. But his other vibe is results. You know, like when he took over England, I stand to be corrected, but I think they won something like the first 20 matches. Yeah, 18 games. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. 18, 18 games straight. I mean, unbelievable. And yes, in the last year, it's all, you know, it's all gone, gone as we say in the trade, tits up. But we probably can't use that anymore. Let me take that one back too. You'll cut it out. As we say in the trade, in the last year, it's all gone belly up. But, oh, come on, don't be so weak, man. Let's at least say testicles. Have some and say testicles. Something like that. Yes. You know what I mean. It's, it's just, it hasn't worked because of that level of intensity and everybody around him is just simply exhausted. But, you know, I don't say that Eddie's the messiah of world rugby, but he's something close to that in the first two, three year, two or three years of his term. I'm just reading a tweet from Tim Horan, a double World Cup winner, of course. Uh, he says, we need a Bledisloe Cup win within two years, a Rugby World Cup semi-final, and a Lions win to justify the decision. Strap yourself in for the ride. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, Tim, Tim's a great commentator, and you know he came in in 1989 against the Lions, and he was the classic example where Bob Dwyer threw him and Jason Little in a little bit before they were perhaps ready, and yet they rose to the occasion, which meant that by the 91 World Cup, these two very young men were already seasoned veterans. And to do Dave Rennie his due, probably he'll be fondly remembered for bringing players through. Like, Eddie's, Eddie's inheriting a team. They're not, they're not the basket cases their stats might appear to be. You know, they, they should have beaten the All Blacks. Yep. They got on their, on their English tour, they were on their European tour, there were two of the results. They were just one point off that they could have and should have won. I mean, there, there's an ability... If you've got a team out there that is capable of besting the All Blacks and bleeding the All Blacks with a minute to go, you've got a pretty good pretty good calibre player to work with, and that's what Eddie's getting, and that's due to Dave Rennie. I mean, he's a nice bloke. The, 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 thing, the thing about Dave Rennie with, compared to Eddie Jones, if you put coaches on the spectrum of good, decent, nice blokes, nice to be around, you know, working all together in a collegiate manner, well, you've got Dave Rennie right up on the left-hand side of the spectrum. If you've got... If, you, uh, if the far right of the spectrum is hard, narky intense, earnest, never, never stop bastard who gets brilliant results. Well, that's Eddie. And so the, the culture that the culture that the Wallabies are about to go through, the change that they're about to go through will be extraordinary because it'll be it, the presence of Eddie. He will hit that dressing room. Cyclone Eddie will hit that dressing room and it'll blow half of them out the door. You know, there'll be, there'll be coaches, assistant coaches blown out the door. There'll be players who don't get it blown out the door. And what you'll be left with, he will do what he did in England. You look for, he'll be looking for players who may not be necessarily the most talented in the business, but can match his level of intensity, his desire to win. And I 
about uh, five or six years ago, England came, Eddie's team came to Australia, beat Australia three tests straight. And at breakfast on the Monday morning, um, I asked Eddie at a, this Q&A thing, tell me about stats. And Eddie gave a fascinating answer. He said, we, don't, we used to care about stats. We don't care much about stats anymore. There's only two stats we measure. When a bloke tackles somebody, how long does it take him to get back in the line? When he is tackled, how long does it take him to get back in the line? The idea being, we want to measure gumption. We want to measure desire. And so he, he places the primacy on, you know, desire to win. Absolute red hot, feral desire, find a way to win. Put players like that on the field who are seriously well trained, well drilled and absolutely fit, as fit as they've ever been in their lives. And 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 watch him go, and that's worked for him. All right, then I'm asking everyone this, and we're going to revisit these comments. And so, think hard, and also make sure you believe thoroughly what you're about to say. Who is going to win the Rugby World Cup this year? Is it the All Blacks? Because I am maintaining that we are not going to win the World Cup, but at the same stupid time, I'm also saying that we have as good a chance as any. What I am saying is that there's probably four or five teams, and I'm not sure any of them are consistent enough to say right now that they can win. But who is going to win in your mind? I think it was Phil Kearns who said 20 years ago, whilst, however, my ass points to the ground, the All Blacks will be favoured for the World Cup. It was some, some quote like that. And I saw Phil the other day, his ass is still pointing to the ground. And I, you know, All Blacks may be narrow favourites, but they're not like they were. The, the All Blacks, you know, in the age of Richie McCaw, they used to be, of course they're going to win. And that was not all, that was not always borne out. I mean, 2007 World Cup, I'll never get over their loss to France. But that 2011, 2015, they were, they were extraordinary and they deserved to win. Right now, they look a bit fragile. Who's going to win? Probably the All Blacks, but it could be England, it could be Australia, it could be, it really will, could be France, it could be Ireland.